We are excited that you've joined us here on YouTube for a great message today that the Lord would use to touch your life. We are excited that you could now subscribe and get several messages that would be, impact your life, whether it is our assistant, Pastor Pierre Cannings, or myself, your Pastor Paul Cannings. And we are glad to serve you. We can also continue this process by not only you subscribing by going to our website. When you go to our website, you could get engaged in our ministries and be able to become engaged in what we're doing here at Living Word Fellowship Church so we get a chance to be a part of your life to grow you. And not only that, we've got a book that would be able to help you to go from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. What are the steps? How do you get there? How do you know you're there, what the fruit of the Spirit looks like? These different things will take place when you get engaged in our website and learn more about us and be able to give. Five ways to give when you get to a website, it explains that. And by doing so, we're able to not just touch your life, but the folks at Living Word. We're able to go across the world for the glory of God by those who subscribe like you will subscribe in impacting lives. So join us again. As more messages are rolled out or you go to messages already there, you're able to see God grow in your life because His Word becomes a viable mechanism to not just know Him, but to experience Him. Come back. Let us grow together. I may join the men's chorus. Mess them up, probably. That is awesome. I'd like to see our men up in here singing. Our men's ministry met yesterday. Uh, if, you, if you are a man and didn't come, you missed out. We had a really good time. Every third Saturday, the men's ministry meet. I hope you all would come out. Young and old. You don't got to be old. You could be young because some of us old just think we young. You know what I mean? Let us stand. I took my grandsons out, and we gonna, I was going to teach them some soccer things. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Next day I got up, my body said, what in the world are you thinking? This what's wrong with you, boy. But it was fun, though. I enjoyed them. I enjoyed my grandkids. I spoiled them. Don't tell my wife, even though she's here, I spent money on them. Maybe they'll stop calling for GG, you know, and start looking for me. <laughs> so I, sp I spent money on them. They we went to two Chick-fil-A's, breakfast and lunch. <laughs> you know why I did that, though. I don't know if it was about them or me. <laughs> my excuse for taking some Chick-fil-A. Let's look at Joshua chapter 6 as we continue this series, this whole year of being intentional being intentional. Look at verse 15. And then on the seventh day, they arose eager, early, at the dawning of the day, and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they marched around the city seven times. At the seventh time, when the priest blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city shall be under the ban. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her in the house shall live. Because she hid the messengers whom we sent. For as for you, only keep yourselves from the things under the ban so that you do not covet them. And take some of the things under the ban and make the camp of Israel accursed. If you take some of the things, it will make the camp of Israel accursed and will bring trouble on it. For all the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and the iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted. The priests blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpets, the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell flat, so that the people went up into the city, every man straight ahead, and they took the city. Dear God, we thank you so much for the models you've given as to how you take obstacles in our lives and tear it down. No matter how impossible they are, how overwhelming the circumstances, how dumb what you say relates to that, we, Lord, you give us this example to teach us how we can live productive in your power. We ask you 
for a clear understanding of this text, God, not just so we know not a Bible passage, but so we know how to trust you. We pray this, Lord, in the name of Jesus to Christ we ask. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> years ago, I think it was about 40 years ago, a survey was done throughout the United States. The survey was done. And on this survey that was done, the question was asked, do you consider yourself a Christian? That's what the survey was about. Do you consider yourself a Christian? 95% of Americans said they did consider themselves a Christian. Now, they sent out another survey, and the survey said, how much of your Bible teaching that you have gone through do you apply to the issues you face in life? How much percent? Well, what is the percent of when you think of a situation you're in that you grab the Bible and relate it to the situation so you know how to apply yourself in it? Only 54% of the people said they did that. Most of the time, they just lean to their own understanding. They lean to their experiences, their past experiences. They lean to what has worked for them in the past, what has not worked. And after they have done all those things, that's what they do. The, by, the, only show, the survey only showed that they only use 54%. Today, I don't think we use that much percentage at all. And that's the issue in this text. The issue in this text that may, may sound shocking to you is that God has a warrior, Joshua. He transitioned from a spiritual leader to a warrior. And when he transitioned from the spiritual leader to the warrior, it was a warrior that was a general in the Egyptian army. Many scholars believe Joshua was the only person that didn't fight in a war. Joshua would stand at the bottom of the mountain and say, come get me. And nobody will because they knew Joshua. <laughs> He had a reputation as a warrior. And that's why when Joshua was sent in as a spy, Joshua came back and said, we could do this. He had a military strategy in his mind from the spies. God is asking him not to use his military strategy, not to use his war experience, but to have a worship service for walls to come down. I want you to see that God took a man named Moses who was a big boy in the Egyptian structure. He was. He was a prince. Moses believed he could rescue the people by himself. So he killed the Egyptian in hopes that the people would come alongside him and go, go on, we see you. And they didn't. And for 40 years, he caused him to walk around with a stick to lead a people, a sheep. Who are this called, who does he call the Israelites? Sheep. He taught him from that stick. He's going to use that stick. Uh, we call it a staff. Okay, a staff. I go with my mama when she had to use, uh, she called it, get my stick, boy. Yes, ma'am. I know what that stick mean. He had a stick, a staff that he would use and God would tell him, I don't need your sword. I don't need your military experience. I don't need you being a prince. I just need you to take this staff. You see, God stripped them down from all that they knew and all that they believed in to get them to do one thing. Be vigilant on his accord. Right. Now, now watch this carefully. Watch this carefully. He took Israel, put them in the wilderness. Do you know how short this trip is? For two million people, it'll take them three months and they'll be in the promised land. Three months. They'll be there. It wasn't that long a trip. If in a car, you probably take you, you know, Robel is from that part of the country, part of the world rather. It'll probably take you, what, 15 minute drive? After 15, 30 minute drive? It's not that far. If you look at the map and you look from Egypt and you go all the way to where Jericho was, it's not far. It took them 40 years. Because he kept saying to them, man does not live by bread alone. Man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's trying to teach them that he, and he came in the New Testament and he said the same thing. He says, this is the bread of life. He who eats of it will never hunger. He's trying to teach us 
that what is easy for us to go do, common sense, experience, education, all these different things to make decisions, he is saying is the worst thing we could do. And if we're not vigilant about applying his word to the issues we face, we will stumble through life. This doesn't mean we turn off everything we know. He's just saying, put that into practice after you conceptually accept what I'm saying. So the concept could not change, but the application, we could turn on everything we got. But don't ever change the concept. Let me give you an example. He tell a man to marry a woman. Okay, that's what he said. But he doesn't say in the Bible the person has to be six foot, rich, poor, educated, or anything. He doesn't say the woman has to be Barbie doll that should be 100 years of age and never gained any weight. He never said that. What he said was make sure the person is saved. That's it. Now, does that mean we just go find somebody to say, yeah, 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 I'm saved? The Bible says, oh, many say, Lord, Lord, but few will enter into the kingdom of heaven. So everybody to say, yeah, 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 that they're saved means they are saved. So therefore, we have to go look for their fruit. Once we see their fruit, the issue is over. See, see, it doesn't matter if the person is a different color. It doesn't matter if the person is a different background. It doesn't matter if the person is educated or not educated. It matters, are they a wife and a husband? Because those definitions mean responsibility. And God is done. So it doesn't mean that we don't ever use our mindset. We just can't change the concepts. And if we're not vigilant about the concepts because we are in this flesh, we will go a different way. So for 40 years, the people of Israel wandered in the wilderness because they used their common sense. These people in the promised land now have that experience to keep them focused. They buried their mothers, their fathers, their uncles, their brothers, their sisters. That's who they buried. And their graves they walked over. And now they're faced with being in front of a wall that is double reinforced. That is 30 feet high. And it is 20 feet deep. And they're in that wall for 40 years. God could have sent them hail and destroy all of them. How you know that? Sinaserib army came up against Hezekiah and Hezekiah cried out to God we can't fight these people we're going to die come on God help us and God sent hail and killed 185,000 Assyrians in a day so God could have just said are oh, they done no 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 God let these people be tall be vigilant warriors with a wall that thick that high it is very difficult to scale that wall. In other words, the situation that he put in front of them is impossible. God has many of us in impossible situations. Whether they're health issues, whether they're marriage issues, whether there are struggles on the job, whether they're financial issues that we got ourselves into that are very high and very difficult and very stressful. Whether there are issues of depression that we struggle with. Whether there are issues of anxiety attacks that we may have, that we continue to have. God sometimes allows us to be in these situations that are beyond us. And there's a reason for it. A reason for it is first seen in verse 15. There's a reason for it. It's not happening by accident. It's not happening just because, well, you know, I didn't live a great life. You know, I messed up and made a bunch of bad decisions. Okay, so did Israel made a bunch of bad decisions. Israel messed up and did a bunch of bad things. They did that. But God did not put that in front of them just because of what they did. That was in front of them before they did the bad decisions. It was in front of the The giants were already tall. The walls were already high. The people were already reinforced. Everything was the way it was before they ever decided not to do God's will. So you can't go back and say, it's because of the bad decisions that these walls are thick. No, they were thick before the bad decisions. So sometimes when we decide, I'm going to walk with God, God lets us see the walls because they've already been there. We just could see them now. And he's not removing them. He's not taking them down. And there's a reason for it. And it all has to do with whether or not we're going to be vigilant about his way of doing things. Are we going to be vigilant when it don't make no sense? Are we vigilant when it's hard, when it's overwhelming? That shows the depth of our commitment to God. Here's the first thing we learn. He calls for us to believe in him before the stuff gets done. 
Watch what he's saying to these people. Watch what you say. Watch what he's saying. These things make no sense. No sense. No sense. That's why this year, I'm not going to be patient about folks not coming back to church. I am not. You could turn me off. I'm still going to say it when you get back. I'm going to be vigilant. We can't be the church we need to be without you. We just can't. We can't. Look at verse 15. Then on the seventh day, they arose early in the dawning of the day. What's the first thing you see in this text? Okay? They didn't wait to decide to do God. But you see, folks, hear me, hear me. This is not easy. Please understand. This is not easy stuff. There's no running water. There's no bathroom facilities. There's no places to go take showers. There's no go down the street and go to the grocery store and buy you some sal salmon. And if you got any sense, a pecan pie. I said it right for all of y'all out there correcting me saying pecan pie. Pecan pie. I said it right this time, y'all. But you got to have a little pecan pie on the side. It just, I think it came from God. Okay? So you go down, you could do those things. No, 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 no. They're eating cornflakes, drinking water for 40 years. That's what they're doing. And there's no restroom facilities. I actually saw some of this in the backwoods of Africa. Don't let people mess up Africa. Africa got cities just like America. They got resorts in Africa. Okay? So, you know, don't, don't, don't twist up Africa. But in the backwoods of Africa, I ne that's why the conference is the way it is when I go there. And I first went there, I saw the ladies walking off, and I said, where are they going? Oh, they're taking showers. Where? In the bushes. In the what? Yeah, we, we've made, we, we did a makeshift a, 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 a place in there. We built them a little place where they could go in there and take the water and take showers. I ain't coming to Africa with a man's wife going in the, in the bushes to take shower in some makeshift shower container. No, when we come here, we're going to raise the money for them to go into at least a boarding house. That's ridiculous. I'm talking to people who are like that, and I'm sitting up in a hotel. Can't do that. I can't do that. That's crazy. That's the way it is for them. That's what they're doing. Dig a hole in the ground. This is where these people are. And he's telling them with an enemy that is huge, loves war, a wall that is thick. Get up and walk around a city. Tell me if that makes sense. Does he tell them, hey, do the 12 o'clock. Start at 3 o'clock when it's hot. No, 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 no. These people got some sense. Common sense came to obedience. They got up in the morning. Why in the morning? It's cooler. And they're immediately responding to God. They don't say, God, there's no delayed process here. That's the biggest mistake you can make with God. If you're not vigilant, you will say, God, you know, I trust you. You know my heart. God, you know I love you. God is saying, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you're not keeping my commandments, you don't love me. You love yourself. Stop telling me that lie. I don't want to hear your lie. I'm a God of truth. If you believe what I'm saying, do it. And I shouldn't have to wake you up to get it done. Just do it. That's exactly what you see here. They're vigilant. There's no waking up. Okay, guys, come on. Now it's time. It's early in the morning. It's the best time. No. Let's do this. And, and folks, they're walking around something like this. It's like they're walking around this entire complex. It's not that big a city. They're literally walking on Holder Forest, T.C. Jester, all the way through that neighborhood next door, all the way back by the school, all the way around here. That's where they're walking. And they're doing it exactly like he said. They've got a military people up front that are carrying weapons. You've got the priests in the middle and some of the military guys in the back. All the people are not walking. Most of the people are not. They're just walking around this city. And they're doing it exactly like he's saying do it. And they're being vigilant about it and doing it exactly like he says, turn to Second Peter. I want you to see this. 
We don't mess up in life because of lack of God. We mess up in life because of a lack of obedience when God is speaking. We mess up in life because we tend to lean to our own experiences. We mess up in life because of fear. We mess up in life because our anxieties take us in directions that cause us to disobey God. That's why we mess up. It ain't God. 40 years the family of these people walk around this wilderness for 40 years doing what? Dying. What do we have on Saturdays in the urban community? Lots of funerals. We, where's a time when we march believing in God and singing his eye is on the sparrow and he's watching over me. We, we marched out of churches. We marched out and dealt with whatever. Now we march. We don't even want to come to the church. The, the Black Lives Matter didn't even look to preachers to lead anything. We're done with the church. We're struggling. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. He says in verse 2, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything. Why? Look at verse 9. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. He is blind, can't see their way through nothing, short-sighted. I don't see how I'm going to make it. There's literally, we say these things. In verse nine, 10, he says, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent and to make certain about his calling and his choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Please read the word Never. You will never stumble. Never. Never is never. He said, anybody that takes my words to the issues they face in this life and they don't wait for me to wake them up, knock them in the head, beat them down. They said, Lord, I get it. I'm ready to do it. He says, they never stumble. Not one time. Watch this carefully. Therefore, brethren, be all the diligent that you make certain about his calling and choosing you for as long as you practice these things. You will never stumble. Look at 1 John. Look at 1 John. Come on with me. I didn't see all of y'all in Bible study. I want y'all to come to Bible study. I intend to pass to you this year the way God tells me. And sometimes people hate your guts for that. There's one thing I keep in mind as a pastor. If they could nail Jesus to the cross, I'd probably be on a bigger cross with more nails than he has, since I'm not perfect like he is. Look at verse, verse 5 of chapter, 1 John chapter 1. He says, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and, he, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth. Please underline the word practice what is truth. So if your life is full of darkness, where I can't figure out how to make any decisions, I can't figure out how to solve anything, I can't figure out how to make my way through any difficulties that I face, and all I do is end up with more mess by the decisions that I make, more problems by the decisions I make, I get more depressed, more frustrated, more difficulty. He says, darkness is because I'm not walking in the truth. I'm not committed to walk the way he says it, because who's the truth? I'm not committed to walk in the Spirit of God. The Bible says the Spirit is the truth. I'm not. What I'm committed to do is to get it done as fast as I can, to do things the way I need to do it, and get it over with and move on. He says, that's why. There's no fellowship with God. I don't feel God is close to me, near me, walking with me. Look at verse 7. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, Jesus his son, cleanses us from all sin. Back to Joshua chapter 6, he says, On the seventh day they rose up early in the dawning in the day and marched around the city in the same, in the same manner seven times. Only same manner meaning the same arrangement God gave them in chapter 5. Around seven times. They're meticulous to understand and to do exactly like God says. Be careful to do my word. Meaning, get a magnifying glass and treat my word like a fruit fly. And get in there and work it. 
My first biology class was the guy comes in the class. No, 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 it was the second, it was the first biology lab. He came in the class, lab and he goes, here's a fruit fly. I want you to tell me what is on this fly. So we all sat there, you know, freshmen, glad to sit there. And we write and dump down. He came back, he said, now keep that list. He came back the next day and he goes, okay, guys, here's, a, here's the same fruit fly. I want you to take a, a, your microscope and I want you to write down something on that, on that, about that fly. And I don't want it to match nothing you said yesterday. And he did that all week. A three-day week class. Monday, Wednesday, Friday class. He did. And what I learned from that, it's funny how God uses that to teach you in different ways. What I learned from that is I could come to the Bible hundreds of times. And I could still find a bigger and a bigger and a bigger list. And one of the reasons why it's like that is because the Bible says the spirit is the truth. He keeps taking you, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, to the depths of God. Once you practice it first. If you don't practice the word of God, it's David killed Goliath. Okay. But when you practice it, the spirit of God opens your eyes. And opens your eyes and opens your eyes and open your eyes and open your eyes and open your eyes and open your eyes. Do you realize there's not going to be a new Bible in heaven, but we're still going to be learning in heaven forever? That's why he says, the nation of Israel was careful to do exactly like I said. Joshua paid attention and he was careful. Here's the second thing you find about these folks that shows that when you're going to be vigilant, God is requiring you before walls come down to believe him and act it out. He doesn't want you to just believe, God, I believe you. Well, let me see your actions. Don't just say you believe me. Show it. Show you believe me. Then we will land this plane. Get in the plane first though. If you believe it's going to land, get in it. Buckle up. I always tell people, y'all do a lot of things for everybody else but God. People give you a job. We have direct deposit. Y'all so believe that? That y'all just go to work. Have you ever asked the people, how is your bank account? Let me check your business arrangements. Because we want the job so bad, we don't ask them. But we go out and get a 30-year mortgage. Who promised us 30-year job? Who promises that? We go buy a car that we know is used. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me give it the right terminology for you. At the end of the day, it's used. We get out the driveway and we drive that thing at 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. We ain't checked the brakes out yet. There's a whole lot of things we do. I see people jumping out of planes with parachutes. We don't have a problem with believing things. We don't have a problem with doing things we believe. We just have a problem with God and believing things. But we believe a whole lot of things. A lot of things. I get a long list. When have you asked your doctor before you went to surgery, how many people had this surgery from you and lived? We say, okay, doc, need surgery. When do I come? And they put us to sleep. Some people got sense to ask for prayer. And some people just say, girl, I'll see you when I get up. Pick me up on the curb. We don't know. We got no idea if this doctor did the surgery and it worked on the people they did. And what is your percent of, percent of success? And did anybody die after you did it? We don't even ask them questions. We'll lay down. Go to the pharmacy and get this pill. What do we do? Go to the pharmacy and get the pill and take it. Some of us don't even go look at the side effects. I tease my wife all the time when you got those pills on television. If you take this pill, you will no longer have cirrhosis. The side effects are you will grow more nails. You'll grow an extra finger. Your hair will fall off. Your nose will change different colors. And you will walk funny. By the time you take the pill... You're going to have more problems after you take the pill. But guess what we do? Oh. We don't have a belief issue with God, with a belief issue with stuff we do every day. We just have a belief issue with God. And that's why he's saying, I'm leaving the problem there. Let me see what you're going to do when the problem is still in front of you. The problem is still a difficulty situation. And you, are you going to do what I say or not? Oh, I got to move the problem first before you believe me. I'm not moving it. 
You must be vigilant because you believe me. That's what God requires. Now here's, this, here's this is what you find. He says in verse 16, he says, at the seventh time when the priest blew the trumpets, just like he said, Joshua said to the people, shout! What is God doing? I mean, in fact, I've been trying to figure this out all week. God, shout? What are we shouting for? Watch this carefully. Then it dawned on me eventually what God is doing here. What is God doing? The horns, matter of fact, Pierre said this in his message last week. The horns are ram horns. Ram horns are blown at worship services. You don't blow ram horns for a war cry. You blow them for a worship cry. He didn't say, sing to me. Good ram's noises are ugly. I don't really make anybody go, hey, thank you, Jesus. Okay? Then he says, I want you to shout. He didn't say sing. So nobody could exclude it from this. Well, I can't sing. He said shout. That's what I love about God and worship. Make a joyful noise to me. He never says make a joyful sound to me until he gets to the musicians. But when he looks at you, he says make a joyful noise to God. He knows some of us can't sing. He says, are you, when you, when you walked into church and your problems were there, are you going to worship me knowing they're still there? Or are you going to wait till the problems are gone for you to put on your dancing shoes and get your happy feet going? Is, is, it, is it going to wait until all of that is happening before you bless me? Do I have to bless you in the fields, bless you when you come and when you go? And Christianity today has been turned into some kind of suit saying thing. Oh, God said this to me today. Do we realize how demonic that is? He calls that an act of the flesh when we are soothsayers. That's what he calls it. You look at it, it's right there in Galatians chapter 5. He's talking about soothsayers as a part of the flesh. The word is right there. So people today want to hear, oh, you're going to be blessed today. God's going to, all them kids at that school, Alonzo, they are going to be perfect next week. They ain't going to give you no trouble. They're going to all want to learn and God is going to give you a great week. That's a lie. We don't, we don't know what tomorrow is going to be. The Bible says if you start talking about tomorrow, say if the Lord wills. Because we don't know. He didn't say, accept the preacher. So why do you all believe that stuff? Okay, I move on. The problems we face are going to be the problems we face on our way in and on our way out. And he says, let me see your worship service, how it's working. Are you going to shout to me? Are you going to get up in here and blow the music and have a good old time before the problems come down? Or are you going to wait till they come down before you get happy feet? I want to see how you are because that tells me how vigilant you are about believing in me. If you really believe in me, since you are not fighting this war, I'm fighting this war. I told you what the promised land is. I established this promised land. I set up this promised land. I'm the one that got you out of Egypt. I'm the one that decided to call you when you're no better than anybody else. Deuteronomy chapter 7 says, you're not any better people than anybody else. I just chose to choose you. So therefore, what are you doing? Did you send manna from heaven? Did you get water out of dry rock? What did you do? You just walked when I told you to walk. So since you're not fighting this war, and I can fight any war, and I can do the impossible, bless me before it happens. I brought you through the Red Sea. I carried you through the wilderness, so how could you doubt me? And I let everybody before you die. How could you not trust me? Oh, folks... That's why he says, the first thing we learn today to be vigilant is to come to worship and worship God. He's not going to get this done by military force. He's not going to fix your problems until he sees where your heart is. That's the only reason why I'm driving you back to worship. I was patient for three years. I'm done. Call me what you want. You want God to change your life. Show your commitment to him and get up off the couch and do what he tells you to do. I love God. Then act what he says. That's the only thing he understands is obedience. Jesus Christ modeled that. I must be about my father's business. You can do what you want of me. You can reject me. You can talk about me. You can put me on a cross. I'm still going to do what my father says to do. Period. I'm going to trust he's going to raise me from the dead. I'm going to trust that. You do your thing. You're not going to change me. 
Here's the thing. Now let's go to verse, verse, walk with me. Let's go to verse 17 because he says, when I give you this land, it could corrupt you. It can corrupt you. Now, so watch this carefully, what he's going to say here. He says right here in verse 17, he says, the city shall be under a ban. And, it, and all that is in it belongs to me. You know, I, I don't like God very much when he said that. All that is in it belongs to me. God, wait a minute now. Why all of it belongs to you? Can I get some of it? He says, no. Matter of fact, Achan decided not to listen. And folks died in the very next chapter when they went to I. Achan's decision, one person's decision, hurt a congregation of people. Two million people were hurt. People died because one person decided they're not going to do it God's way. That's why I keep saying, you can't ask your preacher not to do God's will. It hurts a lot of you. You want your preacher to do God's will. You want elders to do God's will. You want deacons to do God's will. You want ministry leaders to do God's will. Because the worst persons to not do it are leaders. Watch this carefully. He says, go in there. None of this belongs to you. You ever notice, folks? You ever notice at a funeral that there's no U-Haul truck hooked up to the grave? What do we take? Naked we came. Naked we leave. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I never forget my son not driving now. I got his job, walking the house, talking crazy. And I said, son, since you think you could make it, I want you to do me a favor. What's that, dad? He said, you could go. You could, you want to get your own apartment? You're welcome. But I want you to leave everything I ever bought you. He says, what are you talking about? I said, that car. Yep. I want you to take off all your clothes because that belongs to me too. I allow you to go with your underwear so you don't go to jail. So, but I want you to go in your closet, just take off all your clothes and leave the way with everything you bought. But there's some things I bought with my job. You could take what you bought with your job, what you buy with your job. Let's get the suitcase. I said, wow, that's all you got? Nintendo game and PlayStation and... Is that all you got? That's what you're going to take out the door? No problem. Take it with you. You're going to have to have a television, you know. Electricity got to be turned on. All of these things you're going to have to have. But son, you could go. He stopped. He started thinking. I said, son, naked you came. Naked you leave. That's how it works. You have to learn that your little job ain't paying you nothing. Compared to what this person does at this house. At that time, my, mom was, my wife was a stay-at-home mom. In terms of this job that's coming into this house, this person is doing it for one reason, because he loves his family. That's it. I'm not doing it for any other reason. I'd like to go buy stuff I want to buy, but for this family, this is the decision that is made. Because you don't respect it, you're talking crazy. Think about it for a minute, folks. How many people profit off of God? We got oil companies everywhere. Where do they get the oil from? You go, you go to and decide what kind of fish you want to buy. In whose ocean do they fish? Do they help a fish get another fish? You go to Kentucky Fried Chicken if you're saved to get hot wings. <laughs> you get that on the way home. Every now and then I feel like you got to stop and have some hot wings. It's just what God ordered. Every now and then I go on the scale. I go on the scale. I weigh the scale. If I said, okay, I didn't gain any weight. It's time to go exercise. Then I look at the box and said, how much? I, I, this is what I do when I go to Chick-fil-A. How many calories they line saying that I'm going to eat? Okay, well, now if I go lose past that, I didn't gain any weight, but I enjoyed the chicken. Who made the chicken? All they do is take up his creation and butter it up and sell it to us. And we buy it. But who are they doing it off of? God. There's nothing. We're going into space. Who's space? Who's moon? There is nothing we own. That's the only 
reason that God is saying to them, when I put you in there, all the silver, where they get it from? All the gold, where they get it from? All the bronze, where them people in the land got it from? All the milk and honey, where they get it from? All of it belongs to me. So before you leave from nothing, you out in the wilderness, I got to feed you manna from heaven, nothing, and put you in wealth and give you what is there. Before you ever do it, don't take nothing. I want you to understand that everything in this land belongs to me because if you don't understand it it will corrupt you and I will walk from you oh my kids have heard this sermon over and over again I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 8 chapter 8 he says, this kids have heard this over and over again son listen to me listen to me carefully there's two problems you will have in this life that could mess you up and of course they're boys I say it to them if it was had a girl child I'll say it to the girl, my granddaughters listen to me I said to them there's two problems you can have in this life you can have the three of them wealth power and women the wrong woman. I did said wrong woman. I did say wrong woman. Don't throw a rock yet. I said wrong woman. And I would say the same thing to my grandkids. Wealth, my granddaughters. Power, and men, bad men. Those three things can destroy you. I'm not saying it because I'm trying to bust anybody's chops. I'm saying it because it's exactly what you see here. Wealth, power, and they went in the land and they chased the women of the land because God allowed those women to be gorgeous. Will you do what I say? I'm making the giants tall and I'm making the women gorgeous. He tests you to see where your commitment are by setting up the situation to be so enticing that you will see whether or not I would do God when it's nice and good and operating great. That's what he was doing. In chapter 8, this is what he says to them in verse 11. He says, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied and have built good houses and lived in them, and when your herds and your flocks and multiply and your silver and gold multiply and all that you have multiplies, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness it is fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought you water from, from, for you out of the rock of flint in the wilderness. He fed you manna from, from which your fathers did not know that he might humble you so that, that you may be by test you and to do good for you in the land. Otherwise, you may say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. And you shall remember, but you shall remember you, your God. For it is he who is giving you power and make wealth. That he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers. As of this day, God promised to bless us. Psalm 112, a person live righteous, I will give you riches. If you live in wisdom, Proverbs 24, I bless your rooms with riches. I will bless you with long life if you live righteous and live right, fearful before me. Psalm 120, he didn't stop from giving us blessings and happiness. He just said, seek me first. This is what he says. Verse 19, and it shall come about. If you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you today that you will surely perish he continues on and what do you see the nation of israel in babylon and you, you just keep following them as they got rich he says the land this stuff can corrupt you and cause you to become more vigilant about winning that stuff than about god and you spend you know you know how many people come to church on a on, on, can't come to church because of money you know how many people are too tired to read their bible at the end of the day do you know how many people have a hard time praying because they work so much overtime trying to chase all the stuff of the world they can't even pray without falling asleep? Do you know how many people that really can't concentrate on the word of God because they're so worried about money that they can't concentrate on the word of God because they're way above their means when they live? They're stressed out over money. He says, it will corrupt you when you're not vigilant to do me first. So he's telling them, when you go in here, I'm banning you from taking all of this stuff. You can't take none of it. And when you see it and you get it, bring it to the house of God. 
So I know I just, the sermon is over that. Bring it to the altar of God. What is he saying? Why is he saying that? He's not saying that, but for one reason. This stuff that comes to the house of God, use it to build me a house. Why? I'm going to bless you with houses. Is that like I'm not going to bless you with houses? You're going to get this. He's not saying that any time you gain wealth and riches after this point in time, that you can't use it to build your house. He didn't say that. He says when you go into this land, the first time you see what you see, don't use it for your own means. What is he saying? Take care of my house first. If you really put me first, my house can't be last. You can't tell me that you have a good man when he doesn't 